Welcome to Mom Matters. I'm your host, Alyssa DeVere. In the next 10 easy to watch minutes, we're going to give you practical tips for more productive parenting. Today's topic is video game violence and what every parent needs to know about the good, the bad, um, and everything in between. And joining us today is Dr. Cheryl Olson. She is the co-director for the Center of Mental Health and Media in the Department of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. She also teaches in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She um, led, was the principal investigator for a very important study that we're going to talk about during this uh, interview. And her new book, she's the co-author of Grand Theft Childhood, The Surprising Truth About Violent Video Games and What Parents Can Do. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Let's talk about this research study because it was very large and you found some fascinating results out of it. Thank you. This was the, probably the biggest study of its kind that looked at real kids and real parents. A lot of the research you hear about that says, oh, video games cause all kinds of problems, they're lab studies. They're done with a bunch of college students mm -hmm. in a lab getting credit for Psych 101. So we thought it was important to talk to real people. We did surveys of parents and middle school kids, 12 to 14 years old, and we also did focus groups with parents and teens who played violent video games. And one of the really interesting things, we, things that we found is what the parents are worried about. We found there were three main things that the parents were concerned about with violent games. And the first of all wasn't violence, it was actually the time the kids spent playing games. You know, are, are they going to get their homework done? Are they going to do their chores? Get, you know, need to get themselves, you know, get outside once in a while. Right. Uh, the second thing was a concern about social life. The typical image people have, I think, is of a kid playing games up in their room someplace, being isolated, and mm -hmm. parents worried about would their kid have social skills? Would they know how to get along with people uh, who didn't play games in the future when they were older? Okay. And then the third thing was the violent content, and to a lesser extent, sexual content. But it was really interesting. It wasn't just a matter of gore that they were concerned about. It was a matter of several things about the violence, the way it was done. One of the big concerns was who is the target of the violence? Is it a real looking person, or an alien, or a troll, or something like that? Okay. Well, tell me, when you say violence, I'm mm -hmm. stuck on that word because it's very broad. Um, yeah, it can mean killing or murdering somebody, but what, what is it, what's the scope of that when you say violence? That's a great question because that's one of the things that has bedeviled the research on not, not only video game violence, but TV violence going back to the 60s and 70s. If you look at some of the old studies on TV violence where they're saying, oh, they watched TV and, you know, years ago and now as young adults they're more violent, the games listed as very violent in their listing were things like Roadrunner, and the $6 million man. I mean, that's one of the problems with this kind of research is standards change, obviously. Okay. Graphic quality changes. So what violence is is a, is a surprisingly slippery issue. And your study, you said, focused kind of on preteens and teens. Right. Um, I know in my household, my eight-year-old plays games, and there's certain ones I don't let my four-year-old watch, but sometimes I'm not all, you know, I'm cooking dinner or whatever. So I would assume that um, um, it would impact younger children as well. And, and direct ways, TV and otherwise. Absolutely. There is a point where children are too young to recognize fantasy versus reality, and you want to keep an eye on that. One thing we found that was really quite adorable was when we talked to boys who were 12 to 14, we said, well, what should a younger sibling play? They'll say, well, I'm most concerned about the swearing, because they can uh, copy the swearing in yes. the real world. Now, also, I know you found some interesting things about girls. Right. We found that the number one game among girls 12 to 14 was The Sims. You know, no big surprise there. The second most popular game series for girls was Grand Theft Auto. And we were really blown away by that. We didn't realize the girls would be attracted to violent games. Interesting. Are they playing as much as the boys? Not nearly as much. Uh, we found it was pretty common for boys in middle school to play almost every day. A lot of the boys do. For girls, only about 1 in 10 is playing every day. Girls can take it or leave it to a large extent. and. With boys, it's a real focus for social life for a lot of the boys. That's what they get together to do. They have a sleepover. They go rent a new game, and they work together to figure out how to make it uh, you know, work, how to get through it together. Interesting. Well, that's a really good place for us to take a break, because when we come back, I want you to talk about what is a normal game-playing behavior. So as a parent, what are the things I should be looking for, and what should I do if they start to veer off to the abnormal side? We'll be right back. Co-directors of the Harvard Medical School Center for Mental Health and Media Lawrence Kuttner and Cheryl Olson's new book will surprise, encourage, and disturb you. Grand Theft Childhood, The Surprising Truth About Violent Video Games and What Parents Can Do will teach you about when and what video games can be harmful, as well as when they can serve as important social and learning tools. The book discusses video game ratings, setting playing rules, and much more. 
Find Grand Theft Childhood at Amazon.com or bookstores near you. We're back here on Mom Matters talking to Dr. Cheryl Olson about violent video games. And I guess the biggest question on everyone's mind is, children who play violent video games, does this show any um, link to behavior or violence? Right. Parents hear all the time in the media that things like the, the Columbine killings or the Virginia Tech murders are somehow linked or triggered by you know, violent video games. And the evidence just isn't there. So you can relax a little bit about the big, scary things. The Secret Service, the FBI, uh, others have done reports looking at, is there a pattern to these school shootings? Is there a link to violent media? And they have found nothing that suggests that. These kids have a lot of other problems. In fact, with the Virginia Tech case, in the report, the roommates of this poor young man said that we found it odd that he never joined us playing video games. Oh, okay. It could be seen as a marker of his social isolation, in fact. That makes sense. So, Parents are worried about a child just going on imitating something that they see in a game. We don't see a lot of kids out there with Uzis in the street, even though Thank most boy. kids are playing violent video games, especially the boys. Okay, when you say most kids, again, as a parent, what is considered normal behavior with violent video games and what's not? That's a really important question. That's one of the things we try to look at in our research is what are they doing? Because you can't tell by the sales figures, I mean, that who knows who's buying it. We found that for middle school boys, Playing video games is normal. It's something that they orient their social lives around to a large extent. Okay. And if you as a parent walk into your child's bedroom or the den and you see them with a game like Grand Theft Auto, don't freak out because it's normal. It, even if you don't have those games at home and you think you're keeping your kid away from them, they're playing them someplace, trust me. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be hurt by them necessarily. One of the things we found the kids like about these games is that they're so unlike real life. I mean, they like the, that the characters have, have character, they like the, the graphics being, you know, interesting and, and realish, realistic, but they don't want to be like those characters. They want to see what it's like to try out some kind of other personality. So don't worry about that. What are markers of possible problems, things that are not normal, okay. is if a child plays video games alone almost all the time, sometimes it's fine, but they're, they're always alone, that's a problem, possibly. If girls are playing video games every day, especially violent games every day, that's unusual. You might want to look at what's going on there. Okay. You also want to look at how is your child using those games. A, a lot of kids told us that they used violent games as a way to get stressed out at the end of the day, uh, get anger out. So if you see that your child is more relaxed after playing a violent game, maybe that's okay. If your child's more agitated or angry, and that happens you know, more than occasionally, that's a little unusual, and you might want to check that out. Right. Uh, the final concern is our kids addicted to this. I mean, if they're enjoying it, if they're, if they're doing a lot, well, is it more than they would be playing baseball or chess or something that you'd think was a more approved activity? What you want to look for is signs that they're having problems with the games interfering with schoolwork, with friendships, with other kinds of things in their lives. It all makes really good sense. Great tips. I want to thank you so much for being here. I'm going to wrap up today's show, remind you about our website, which is www.mom-matters.com. Our previous shows as well as future shows are there, and we thank you for joining us today. This is Alyssa DeVere from Mom Matters, giving you practical tips for more productive parents.